Hi on MPI brought to you by DigiKey and Adafruit. Thank you, DigiKey. This week it's Nexperia. Lady Ada, what is the new product introduction, otherwise known as IMPI of the week? This week. Um, okay. Uh, so this week we're looking at Nexperia again. Uh, some engineers may remember them when they were called NXP. Uh, they now have a new bitchin logo with this like cool X thing going on there. Uh, and we're going to look at the NBM 51 and 7100 series of chips. These are kind of interesting. Uh, so these are battery boost chips. Uh, they're little QFNs, as you see here. And uh, the flyer, which, you know, I checked out and I saw this actually posted on social media. A couple other people noticed it. It's a very interesting chip. So this is designed to be used with lithium coin batteries, not rechargeables, the premium metal lithium batteries like CR2032, you know, I think there's also like 2016, and then there's like the 2540s. Um, they're very small, they're very energy, energy dense, but they have a couple downsides that makes them tough for use with IoT devices, particularly ones that have wireless transmission, because, you know, you have that little burst of energy you need to transmit the data over Bluetooth or Zigbee or cellular or even Wi-Fi, or you know ESP now or whatever your uh, or Laura whatever your um, wireless transmission uh, medium is, and um, people really like coin cell battery batteries because of their ultra small size, energy density, and thinness. So you know even though we really love lithium polymer batteries here, you know they're a little bit more expensive than coin cells. They do need to be recharged, and I have a recharging circuitry. Whereas coin batteries, you know, they do have very good density and you can get them at grocery stores and users can replace them. So, you know, you've seen like the Apple uh, location tags, the iTags and the tiles, they use coin batteries. Um, they last many, many months because they're really smart about how they do their energy management, but then users can replace them very easily and the batteries can be recycled. Um, so you can pick up your standard CR2032 coin battery for, you know, 30 cents or less. Um, these are 3.2 millimeters uh, thick and 20 millimeters wide. They give you three volts nominal and they have about like 220, 240 uh, milliamp hour uh, batteries. Um, these NBM 51 and 71 chips also work with uh, these, oh man, I'm gonna remember that, lithium thionyl chloride. These are much more expensive, but they're incredibly power dense and they give you 3.6 volts out. Notice that the, even though there's 3.6 volts, it's not a rechargeable lithium battery. These are still primary non-rechargeables. These are often used for real-time clocks um, or other industrial uses where you really need extremely high power density and you don't mind spending, as you can see, they're about $5 a piece compared to the, um, the lithium coin cell batteries, but um, both of these can be used with the NBM series. Okay, so, you know, and here's, you know, showing uh, a good example from the data sheet about when you, and why you'd want to use this. So on the left, uh, you've got your standard coin cell battery, lithium manganese oxide, again, about, you know, 240 milliamp hour, three volts nominal, the uh, thionyl 3.6 volts, and you see the energy density compared to double A's, which are 200 watt hours per kilogram. Um, the lithium coin cell, lithium metal coin cell batteries have about, you know, 50% uh, more um, energy per gram. And the lithium thionyl has like two and a half times as much. So a really big difference. So like, why would you ever use alkaline batteries? Well, first off, alkaline batteries are, you know, very inexpensive um, and they're available also, but they're much larger. Like, you know, even AAAs are the smallest batteries you can get, are not anywhere near as small as your lithium coin cell. They're not as thin. Um, and of course you need like this, the spring holder as well. But the most important thing that keeps people from being able to use coin batteries in a lot of cases where they have difficulty is that internal resistance that's documented at the bottom. For your alkaline batteries and your lithium polymer and ion batteries um, and, and most reusable or rechargeable batteries, your internal resistance is really low. It's under an ohm. Whereas for these lithium metal batteries, the internal resistance, resistance is quite high. At the beginning of life, 10 ohms. At the end of life, 70 ohms. So before you even get to um, 
sorry, go to the next image. I, I swapped them. Before you even get the voltage out, your current is passing through what is called the IR, the internal resistance, which here is modeled as nine ohms, uh, because in this data sheet for the energizer battery, um, they do show you how to calculate it. It does, you know, it's it's not purely linear. It depends a little bit on your drain um, and how often you're pulsing it. But basically, you know, you're it's 10 ohms at least. So let's say you're drawing, um, you know, 100 milliamps out to a very small amount of time, only for 10 milliseconds. We're so drawing 100 milliamps out to transmit data over Bluetooth. 100 milliamps isn't too much for your radio. That's going to give you a drop of uh, one volt because you know 10 ohms 100 milliamps do the math equals ir uh your voltage drop is going to be one ohm so what would normally be yeah oh no but uh sorry what would normally be a three volt output across the battery is across the entire thing two volts and two volts is probably going to be too low for your microcontroller or radio to run and so you're going to get really bad performance you're not going to get the distance you need even though you only needed that current for 10 milliseconds doesn't matter. The instantaneous, instantaneous voltage drop is still gonna be there. So what can you do? Well, um, you know, basically don't try to draw a lot of current from a coin battery that that's not what they're good for. Instead, what you can do is you can slowly sip current off. If you're sipping only one milliamp off instead of a hundred milliamps, then instead of a one volt drop, you're gonna get, you know, a 10 millivolt drop or something or, or less. And for a lot of IoT wireless little sensor nodes, they're not transmitting constantly. They're only going to be transmitting once every minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe even once an hour. Like those little tile things, they don't transmit constantly. They're just kind of saying, hey, I'm here. And then they go back into an ultra deep sleep of, you know, a couple microamperes or less uh, of current uh, during their deep sleep cycle. So what the NVM 7100, 5100 does, as you can imagine, is it slowly sips current from the battery um, over a long period of time and then charges up this capacitor that it will store the, the current charge into. And then when your chip needs to you know, drag that 100 milliamps out for that quick burst of wireless, it's like, boom, I'm gonna provide that to you, but I'm providing it to you off of a non high internal resistance component like a low ESR capacitor. So uh, here's how it works. You've got the NVM chip here and you see on the left v VBT, that's the battery and you have you know, a stabilizing capacitor there. You've got your inductor because inside is both a buck and a boost converter. It's actually boost then buck. The voltage gets boosted up, charges that cap on the top right of the schematic, the very big C store, boosts it up to you know, 12 volts because you're, um, you want to store a high, amount of power and the power is going to be you know the voltage and the capacitance um you know you're for small scale capacitors you're not going to be able to get really above 100 uh microfarads but you can get higher voltages fairly easily without a lot of cost so it's easier to boost up the voltage to 12 volts on the capacitor and then when your microcontroller says it's ready start you know it needs uh current um to transmit it tells the chip the chip converts from the boost mode to the buck mode and it bucks down from that charge stored on the capacitor down to your 3.3 volts or 2.8 volts or whatever you need you transmit the capacitor drains out and then the cycle begins again so you do have to specify that c store capacitor pretty well and there is documentation you can go through you know all the details basically you know, as a as a rough idea, if you're drawing 100 milliamps for 10 milliseconds, you need a 100 microfarad, 12 volt or 16 volt capacitor. Uh, you know, there's conversion loss 20% here and there, and of course you want to over specify because temperature and uh, the DC offset can affect the capacitance. Basically, you end up with you know about 100 um, microfarads here. I think that yeah, the calculator here is uh, sorry 10 yeah 100 microfarads. Um, and then you also need a bypass cap on the input, uh, 10 microfarads to stabilize it. And you can go through and actually you do the math of like how many joules of current, you know, of, of power do I need? Um, so if you remember your introductory to electronics physics classes from college, then, uh, you know, basically doing that math like a problem set in here 
um, but you follow the math and then figure out the capacitor and then you just lay it out. And you know, they even show like, look, you know, here's how big the circuit is compared to your CR2032. Um, you still have enough space for your little wireless chip on the other side or even on the same side. The capacitor is going to be the largest component because you know, it does have to buffer all of that power uh, for the transmission. Um, but it does it all for you. And then, you know, there's actually um, two versions of this chip. Well, there's four versions total. So you can program it over I squared C or SPI. So you're wondering, like, well, why do I need I squared C SPI? You have to tell it for the buck and boost converter, you know, what's the maximum voltage and how much current and how often you're going to probably use it. And you can set some specifications over I squared C or SPI. There's also whether they support up to 5.5 volts or uh, 11 volts output on the capacitor. You know, you're going to figure out whether you need that extra voltage, the extra data, uh, power storage for the A, for the 7 series versus the 5 series. The I squared C version, there is also, um, you, while you can configure it over I squared C, it also does free run. So if you're basically, you know, you don't need to, you don't want to tweak and customize it. Or if your circuitry just doesn't have it, you don't want to have to like boot up and, and configure the I squared C. You want to just kind of run on its own. The I squared C version does have a free one. So you can choose between the NBM 71 or 5100A. And, you know, you don't have to set the registers or you, know, you can if you want. There is also an eval board um, that you can use and you can break off the, it's kind of cute. You can snap off the board when you're done. Um, but you can use it to uh, experiment with, um, different load settings, different timing settings. And there's also a uh, PC software that lets you do the I squared C register configurations. If you, if you so want to do so, again, there is a free running mode as well. So, you know, well, you're probably wondering, wow, well, gonna, you am I going to spend a lot of money? No, it's about a dollar. It's um, a pretty good deal. And then of course your inductor and capacitor will be, you know, 20 cents a piece each extra. Um, it does at your cost, but it could, you know, easily triple your expected life because you're not going to be losing um, all that power, all that voltage to your uh, internal resistance um, by slowly sipping the power and then bucking down when you need it and sending data over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or LoRa. So a really good small solution for coin cell battery powered projects from DigiKey and Xperia. And that's on MPA. Bye. Hi on MPI.